was the Radioactive Kids with Welcome to Nuclear City from their self-titled album, Radioactive Kids. I'm Derek M. Cook, welcoming you to Monster Kid Radio, the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic monster movies of yesteryear. And this is episode 51, part two of our look at the Artcraft Theater's Monster Mania event, six Universal Monster Movies. Over the course of a weekend, Scott and Tracy Morris returned to Monster Kid Radio to tell us about their experience going to this mini film festival. In part one, they talked about the first two movies they saw, Dracula and the Wolfman. And here in part two, they're going to tell us about the final four movies they saw as part of this event. Four movies over the course of one very long Saturday. And the event culminated in a reviewing of my favorite film of all time. And I'm really excited to hear what Scott and Tracy have to say about that film, as well as the other movies in the lineup. What movies are they? Well, you're just going to have to listen to find out. I want to keep this short and sweet. All of our contact information is available over at our website, as well as links to our Facebook group, our YouTube channel, and our Flickr album. While you're at our website, go and take a look at episodes 44 and 45. Now, these are the episodes where we talked about the movie Island of Terror with friend of the show, Tom Beagler. Now, Tom is a sculptor. He's an artist and he's a generous one at that. He has created a new piece of artwork, a couple of silicates from the movie Island of Terror. And not only are these sculpts, it's a diorama. There's silicates doing what silicates do in the movie. And he has donated this piece of original artwork to the show. And listeners, it's real easy to enter the drawing for this piece of artwork. All you got to do is email me your name, your mailing address, and the name of a modern monster movie that you think monster kids would need to see. Normally on Monster Kid Radio, we stick to the previous eras of monster movies. Typically, we don't get out of the 60s under most circumstances. However, this time around, we're asking you to take a look at movies that came out within the past 10 years and come up with a movie that you think monster kids are going to dig. Get this in an email to me by the end of this month. That means by this Saturday, we need to get your emails in, and then I'm going to put you in a drawing. And in early December, I'll draw a winner out of all the entries that we've received, and you're going to receive this one-of-a-kind piece of original artwork featuring the silicates. Again, go back to episodes 44 and 45 and check out the episode images for those episodes so you can see what the artwork looks like, and they look so much better in person you have no idea how jealous i am that one of y'all is going to get this and i don't get to keep it big thanks to tom for making that happen and big thanks to everybody who's given us a review in the itunes store remember we've got the 50 review challenge going on right now if we can get up to 50 honest reviews in the itunes store we're going to launch a new feature here on monster kid radio so head over there if you're a user of itunes and drop us an honest review I'm not just looking for a handout. I'm not looking for a gimme. I'm not just saying five stars, whatever. Give me an honest review. Once we get 50, something special on the show that I think you guys and gals are going to dig. You know, I'm just eager to get to Scott and Tracy in part two of our look at the Arcraft Theater's Monster Mania event. We'll get to that right after this. Hammer Film Productions began in 1934, and after producing almost 200 films and television programs, the studio is still releasing and re-releasing new and classic film titles. 1951 Downplace is the podcast that brings you the story of the great Hammer films, one movie at a time. Here are your hosts describing what Hammer means to them. First is Casey. Hammer means the beautiful and glamorous women of Hammer Horror, the engaging storytelling, and amazing period films. Joining him is Derek. Hammer means the incredible work of actors like Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, and even Michael Ripper. The gothic storytelling, the incredible music, and the set pieces. And finally, here's Scott. The man played 21 seasons in Major League Baseball, and for my money, he's still the home run king. This boy has a lot to learn. Join our hosts as they make their journey through the Hammer Films catalog and discuss each film with critical opinion, historical facts, production notes, and other information about these classic films. 1951 Downplace can be found in iTunes or their website, www.1951downplace.com. I thought this podcast was about Hammer and Hank Aaron. 1951 Downplace, the home of Hammer Films discussion. Day one at the historic Artcraft Theater in Franklin, Indiana, Monster Mania. Our guests, Scott and Tracy Morris from Disney, Indiana, and Scott's also my co-host at 1951 Down Place. They got to see Dracula and the Wolfman. Well, they went back for day two 
four films over the course of, well, I guess eight, nine hours at the art craft. The day started at three o'clock in the afternoon, and I think we walked out of the art craft at about 20 after midnight. I think so. So for listeners just now joining us, Scott and Tracy, longtime friends of me, longtime support of my various podcasting projects. They've been on the show before, like I said. They are the co-hosts of the long-running Disney Indiana podcast. I've been doing that for five plus years now. Is that right? Yep. We just hit episode number 140. We do an episode every other week. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. Even though they run around their house wearing, you know, Mickey Mouse T-shirts and Mouseketeer hats and all that, they love their Disney. They also love the classic monster movies. And to see these films, 35 millimeter print at a historic restored movie theater in Franklin, Indiana, to go back for day two of a two-day film festival, man, I mentioned it in the episode a couple of days ago. I wish I could have been there. I would have just hid in Scott's pocket and snuck in to watch the movies myself. I'm so jealous. <laughs> Well, there was one question I wanted to, as a recap from the last episode where we talked about Dracula and the Wolfman, yeah. have you seen either of those films on a big screen? No, I have not. Which is why he's so jealous. Yeah, it's something that you now have up on me, Scott. <laughs> not that I'm keeping score. I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't seen either one of those on the big screen. I have seen one of the films that we're going to talk about in this episode of Monster Kid Radio on the big screen before. And I think probably the last time I saw it on the big screen, you both also saw it on the big screen as part of the same event. We're talking about Frankenstein. But was that the first movie that showed in this lineup? Oh, no. The first movie, uh, which was at about 3 o'clock, was 1933's The Invisible Man. Ah, now see, in the last episode, you guys were talking about how much you enjoyed Claude Rains and you wanted to see him again in another film. Uh, yeah, uh, we had to wait uh, all the way to the end to see him. But <laughs> First time for either of you? First time. Yep. Loved Visible this Man. film. Oh, it's so good. Directed by James Whale. Uh, now, this is after he's directed Frankenstein for Universal. So he's already one of Universal's guys. I mean, the, the special effects technology on display in this film is amazing. But that's not what this movie only is. There's a great story and great performances. Well, it's amazing. We talked, we touched on this a little bit on the last episode where it was a 10-year gap between Dracula and the Wolfman. Now we just have a two-year gap from Dracula to Invisible Man. And to see the advancements that Universal had made in making their films was amazing just in those two years. It also leads me to believe that, again, a lot of the difference between these two films was the director, Todd Browning versus James Whale. Oh, because sure. Because the performances that Whale got out of Claude Rains and Gloria Stewart and William Harrigan were just amazing. And, of course, Una O'Connor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Okay, the elephant in the room, Una O'Connor. What are your thoughts on her? Oh, she's a hoot. I really liked her character. Again, it took me probably about three of her scenes in before it clicked that, again, I have seen this actor before. She was the servant in Bride of Frankenstein, yes, playing, yes. in essence, the same per character, the same person. Yeah, my understanding is that James Whale just loved her. So, <laughs> I kind of liked yeah. her better in this film than in, in Bride of Frankenstein. I did like her in Bride, but this one, she seemed to have a little bit more to do with the actual story. True. Yeah. For me, I like her better in The Invisible Man because when The Invisible Man comes along, it's its own thing. It's its standalone piece. Bride of Frankenstein is following up on Frankenstein. And Bride of Frankenstein by itself already has a slightly different tone than the first film. True. And James Well really was able to kind of cut loose and do whatever he want. Well, with some restraint, <laughs> but was able to do more and let his own personal style seep into the film and that's where Una comes in. Whereas the first Frankenstein, it's a much more dry, much more serious film. So, I don't know, I like Una better in The Invisible Man because when she turns up in Bride of Frankenstein, I'm just reminded that this is not like Frankenstein. Mm. Oh. But she's great in this. Oh, yeah. She, she's so much fun. But uh, she wasn't really my favorite uh, character. And my favorite character, of course, was Dr. Jack Griffin, The Invisible oh, yeah. Man himself, Claude Rains. I just thought he was amazing in this film to portray such passion, such a movement where you don't actually see him, but he's a, a strong screen presence was amazing. Massive props to Claude Rains being able to act while wrapped in bandages and right. to be able to give such a forceful performance. 
And if the what we've read is true and the fact that he's claustrophobic, that makes it even that much more amazing. I wonder how much of that might have been channeled into the mania that he has, especially as the film progresses. He gets longer you know, further into the film and he's just his grasp on reality is tenuous at best and he's just kind of laughing and skipping and all this other crazy stuff happening. Mm-hmm. He's so, I mean, it's a great performance in this film. I feel like because this film also had such jaw dropping special effects for the time, maybe at the time, and I don't know, I wasn't around back then and I haven't done a lot of research. I wonder if some of his performance was overlooked because of the technical elements of the film being so ahead of their time, basically, as well. But he's so good. Again, <laughs> Claude Rains obviously stole the show. I didn't like Arthur Kemp as a character. But I admire William Harrigan's work in portraying this kind of almost craven character. Well, I don't think you're supposed to like him. True. He's one that you can't trust because even when he's agreeing one thing, he's planning on stabbing you in the back anyway. Yeah. Plus, he was in love with Flora, who was Dr. Jack Griffin's fiance, girlfriend, love interest, what have you. Another love triangle. Yes, another love triangle. You know, and you know, we, you mentioned this in the last episode a couple of days ago. There are a lot of, I mean, I think every single movie that we're going to talk about is going to have a little bit of that mm-hmm. in it. Sure, some of it might have been cultural and societal and that sort of thing at the time. But I wonder also if by throwing in these token women characters, the studio was trying to get the woman audience as well. You know, these weren't movies designed for, you know, young men or whatever. These were pictures that the family would go out to see, you know? True. Dracula was billed as one of the greatest love stories, you know, ever, which is Creepy. weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's carried on even to modern day now. You can't get a vampire or Dracula story without having the romance shoved down your throat, whether you want it or not. And sparkling at that. Oh, I see. I wasn't going to go there. Every time you mention it, you give it more power, Tracy. Ooh. <laughs> the vampire who shall not be named. That's right. But back to the Invisible Man. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about the Invisible Man. <laughs> So good. Uh, you know, the, the performance of Reigns, I'm right there with you. But the special effects for a 1933 film was absolutely amazing. Yeah, I would love to know kind of who came up with the idea for the scenes where you see Dr. Jack Griffin unraveling his bandages or being partially dressed. They actually dressed Claude Rains in a form-fitting black jumpsuit with a, you know, a black mask and then filmed him against a black velvet background. So that would all blend in, and then used matting techniques to put that on top of the actual scene. So you got basically an early form of green screen Mm -hmm. that's still used today. Without the aid of special computers or even special cameras, they were creating this guerrilla-style special effect that is just oh so effective. It's very believable. You know, seeing that scene, I was just like, wow. They did this 70-some years ago, and it still really held up. I mean, the, the scenes where he's completely invisible and he's manipulating things, that is a little more obvious that they're being pulled by strings or what have you. Well, I've seen films that are much later where they, they try to pull off invisibility in some way that aren't done near as well as this film. Exactly. Well, the first time you, quote unquote, see the Invisible Man, he's walking through the snow and you see the footprints form. I mean, that to me was amazing. Like, mm-hmm. How did they do that in 1933? How did somebody figure out how to do that? That right. to me is just. And then, of course, we, we touched on it a second ago, the performance of Claude Rains, especially the going crazy part of the performance was amazing. Uh, there was in the story, there's an element of his invisibility formula, monocane, mm-hmm. I believe it was that has been known to drive men mad. And when he starts going crazy, I believed it. I I really thought he was going crazy because he was just full on into that character. And just the whole scene where he's in that room above the bar early on and Uno O'Connor's character is bringing him food and basically starting to demand the rent and he just goes crazy. and goes this ballistic is, on her. Yeah, and this is what you, spying in the windows and looking through the keyholes, this is what you want to see. And he starts, that's the first time he starts taking off all the bandages and everything and throwing things around the room. And it was just, yeah, this guy is nuts. Yeah, he starts unraveling, literally. Literally. <laughs> 
I no, also liked stuff. again his confrontations with uh, Dr. Kemp. You know his his former colleague, his former friend, bullying this guy into doing his bidding because being invisible. Yeah, in some ways you're all powerful, but you got to be naked to do things. Right. And being nude in the English winter cannot be a comfortable situation. <laughs> no, we talked about those footprints in the snow. I mean, come on. I'll take a man of some stamina. <laughs> but, you know, I just like some of the, the, you know, the speeches where he talks about, you know, I'll kill important men and I'll kill some non-important men just to show them how powerful I am. Well, and that's, I think, the key to his portrayal here is the speech is the speaking he's got such a classic voice he sounds like a scientist who could have figured out how to do this he sounds like somebody who's going on this journey from you know this intellectual mastery to psychosis and insanity practically i mean he's got the voice the the delivery that you need for a movie like this you know there are some reports that karloff was considered for the role but man i couldn't imagine karloff's voice in that role if they would have picked him, I don't think the scenes where he's describing some of the scientific stuff would have worked as well as Claude Rains did with them. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, the voice is key to this. I mean, there's a reason why the next Invisible Man we'd see, uh, no pun intended, is Vincent Price. I mean, again, it's the voice. You know, you've got to have that. Well, that's all he had to act with. Right. And I also think it was effective. You know, we talked about the very end of the movie being the first time you actually see dr griffin is to realize he's not a large imposing person he's he looks fairly meek and mild claude rains being a not very big person he's about five six five seven i think that added to the physical contrast of his appearance versus his grandiose insanity right and again seeing karloff seeing someone that powerful in that role, there wouldn't have been that contrast there. No, not at all. You need that. Just to kind of set everything on edge a little bit, you kind of need that. Well, I'm glad you guys liked this one. This one's a good one, and I think I'd recommend the next one, too. I'd recommend the follow-up that does have Vincent Price in the role of a Invisible Man. It's not the same Invisible Man, but there are connections in that film to this one. You know, there's a brother of somebody, and I'd recommend it as well. I have not seen the rest of the Invisible Man quote-unquote franchise. There's like the Invisible Agent, the Invisible Girl. I haven't seen those. And then, of course, the Invisible Man also turns up in Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein. So just briefly, though. And then there's the Ed Begley Jr. version in Amazon Women on the Moon. Yeah. That, oh, well, how can we forget that? <laughs> yeah, I did kind of find myself coming into watching the Invisible Man, having that be my prior experience. You didn't so, see The Hollow Man with Kevin Bacon? Come on. Oh, no. I, I have seen that movie and or, its sequel. <laughs> Memoirs oh, of an Invisible Man with Chevy Chase? Ooh. That one I have not seen. Directed by John seen, Carpenter? Come I think on. I've seen parts of that one. <laughs> uh, this one's better. The Invisible Man is oh, a yeah. much better film. Oh. Yeah, yeah, this this was one of my favorites from the whole weekend, was uh, seeing this film. Oh, wow. Okay. Not my top favorite, but it was up there. Okay. Well, what was the next one in the lineup? The next one was 1932's The Mummy. The Dracula remake. <laughs> yeah, now that you say that, there are some interesting <laughs> overlaps, but I like this one a lot better than I did Dracula, to be honest. Yep, just a year later. Well, it's got a stronger cast. It's got a much stronger cast. And what's interesting about this film, about The Mummy, it's directed by Carl, I think it's Freund, is how it's pronounced. Freund, friend, starts with an F. Carl F. directed the film. <laughs> Uh, he also did the cinematography on Dracula. So you have hmm. that lush cinematography, some of the dark shadows when you need them in this film as well. I call it a remake right down to the music at Swan Lake in the opening and closing credits. It's Fair about enough. this undead guy who finds his love after, I was about to say, crossing oceans of time. But isn't that from the Gary Oldman film? I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's very similar in story to Dracula, but it's totally different as well. Uh, I much prefer this film over Dracula. Mm. I'm not, I'm not, I enjoyed Dracula. I'm not in a big hurry to watch it again. The Mummy, I could sit down and watch it again right now. I love this wow. film. I loved okay. Boris Karloff's performance in this film. Do you like Van Sloan better in this or Dracula? That's a tough question. Probably I, here he yeah. seemed a little more 
confident, a little more assertive in what needed to be done. Again, in the in Dracula, I thought he made a fairly ineffective Van Helsing until like the very last, very last scenes. Right, I agree with you there. He was more a dry scientific type of Van Helsing as opposed to the Peter Cushing man of action Van Helsing we're yes. used to. Whereas here, as Doctor Mueller, he was again still the scientist, but he seemed more invested in what was going on. He does seem more like. Somebody who's wanting to learn more. Mm -hmm. His brain is open. His mind is open to learning more and and going on this adventure. Whereas his Van Helsing is very, I know everything. I'm the authority. You know, just not as an engaging character, as much of an engaging character as he is in this one. I also liked David Manners' role much better. He's better in this. this Oh, very much so. Yeah, he's better in this. I think overall this has a better cast. Even people who turned up in other movies, the cast is allowed to do more. Mm -hmm. I was also a big fan of Zeta Johan in this film. There was a couple of scenes with she and Boris Karloff that there appeared to be genuine sparks going on. And the fact that she also kind of believed in reincarnation herself and brought some of that to her performance. Hmm. She's really just, I wish she had done more. Yeah, you know? I, I do too. I I yes. really enjoyed her her work in this film, and, and and I also like at the end of the film where she all of a sudden realizes what's going on, and and the light bulb changes, and I, I was blown away by her performance. I was yeah. real impressed. Of the four movies we've discussed so far, she is definitely the strongest female character, even though she does get hypnotized more or less by Boris Karloff. As Scott just said, she comes to the realization that. While, yes, she may be Princess Ankes Amun, she is also Helen Grosvenor. And if she has to choose between the two, she'd rather be Helen. Big points. Double points. Bonus points to Tracy for pronouncing that name correctly. <laughs> it helps when you have it spelled out phonetically on the screen. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. See, I wasn't going to you know, reveal the secret, but okay. No, it's a great film. And I love mummy stories. I love the mummy movies. I will even say that I kind of sort of enjoy some of the Brendan Fraser films. Dramatic pause for Tracy to swoon. Mm-hmm. Well, that, <laughs> that was my background coming into this film, having seen the Brendan Fraser quote-unquote remakes. Yeah, and, I mean, they're kind of adventure movies. That yeah, they're, they're very much, I mean, they both start from kind of the same point, but the Fraser movies, the recent movies take, you know, as you said, very much an action adventure turn where the original The Mummy is much more focused on the supernatural reincarnation yeah. elements. Yeah, it's a m- deeper story. Now, my experience with The Mummy is I have this film and I've seen the Brandon Fraser film, but also the Hammer version of The Mummy. Ah. And I'm probably going to lose hammer points for saying this, but I prefer this version. Really? Yes. Even though it's got Peter Cushing. And Christopher Lee. And I oh, thought Christopher yeah, Lee was was amazing as the mummy because of his expressive eyes in that film. But I preferred Boris Karloff. Not only playing the mummy, Imhotep, but also as Arden Bay. I thought he sure. was good as Arden Bay, too. I do prefer Karloff over Lee in the role of the mummy character. Now, we talked about the mummy on 1951 Down Place, episode 21, May of this year, actually, if you go over to my... That was the episode to, that I missed. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. You I, I, there. Was, I was gone that time. That, that that's month. right. That was one of my favorite episodes, so go over to... <laughs> 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 no, nah, it's not true, but do check out the link in the show notes to that episode to hear Casey and I talk about that film. And Scott, the, I believe, did come on the following episode to talk about his thoughts about the movie. Yes, I did. So well, I'll put a link to that as well in the show notes over at monsterkidradio.net. But I preferred this version to that one. I just, I, I, I liked Boris Karloff. I liked uh, Zeta Johan. I was amazed, though, you know, think, seeing this film from 1932 and seeing the outfit that she was wearing near the end of the film. It seemed to me like something you wouldn't see in this movie. You would probably see it more in a more modern version of yeah. it. I actually found a fit, kind of interesting quote about Zita Johan and her interactions with Carl Freund in the 
Universal Studios Monsters book by Michael Mallory. So let me dig that up real quick. Yeah, Zeta, in a 1989 interview, said, The first thing he, Carl Freund, said to me, he didn't say hello or anything, was, quote, In one scene, you have to play it nude from the waist up. He wanted me to say the hell I will so he could blame everything that went wrong on me. But I told him, it's all right with me if you can get it past the censors. She sounds like an amazing woman, doesn't she? Yes. <laughs> Just a spitfire of a girl rocking around the movie set. I would have loved to have seen her do more. Yeah, and, and to be honest, the outfit she was wearing wasn't that much more than no, being was... nude from the waist up. It was a couple little strips and straps and sparkles, and that was about it. <laughs> It got me wondering yeah. about the Hayes Code, so I did go oh. back and do a little bit of research. It turns oh. out the Hayes Code, which of course cracked down on, you know, nudity, it cracked down on a lot of violence, violence and I mean, it, it put a lot of restrictions on the film system. It was created in 1929, but the serious enforcement didn't start until July of 1934. So the Mummy being released in 1932 was able to get away with a little bit more. Yeah, it's a, a great film. You know, to see that on the big screen would have been a real pleasure for me. At the risk of ending this interview right here and now, this was my favorite film for the entire weekend. It's okay. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hold off on sharing mine till we get to the end. <laughs> uh -huh. No, it is a good movie. And I, like I said, I've got a real mad love for mummy movies. I, You know, you put a mummy in something and I'm going to watch it at least once, which might say something about my standards, but I love mummy films. I absolutely adore them. And I think this is one of the granddaddies of them all. One of the most important mummy films. It's just really important and kind of trend setting almost. You've got so many, I don't know, is this the very first mummy film? I don't know if it is or not, but you've got so many things in this film that would appear in later mummy films. Now the rest of the mummy franchise from universal has absolutely nothing to do with this movie. Hmm. It's a completely different mummy, completely different place, completely different characters. Karloff's not in it at all. Chaney himself shows up in some of those films. He eventually takes on the role of the mummy. Chaney actually, of all the classic Universal actors, would do the most. He played the Wolfman. He played Frankenstein's monster. He was in Son of Dracula as either Dracula or the Son of Dracula, depending on how you interpret the film. And then he would also appear in some of the mummy films as well. So, I mean, he even so he got to get wrapped up in bandages, so... Now, The Mummy is definitely a film I'm looking forward to going back to and checking out on the Blu-ray set, the uh, Universal Monsters Blu-ray set, which we bought as a consequence of going to see these films and checking out all the special features. Yeah, but I, I'm definitely interested in seeing more Boris Karloff films as well. Yeah, we, we've got a list about a yard long now of movies we want to see based on performances <laughs> in these films. We, That's awesome. we had kind of been putting them off because we didn't want to taint this interview with any of the other things that we had seen. So <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> well, what was the next movie in the lineup? 1931's Frankenstein. So there this was go. another evening performance. This was their 730 the performance. 730 on so, Saturday night. Yep. So we had not only the movie, we had the little short attention span theater skit done by the volunteers. We had the drawing for the prizes and the uh, who had traveled the longest contest as well. And this was probably the best attended film of the six, I think. Partly because of the time slot and partly because it, it was probably the best known of the films they were showing. Well, I think I did see... A couple days or maybe a week later that they posted on the Facebook that the art craft that there was over 1,500 tickets sold for the entire weekend. Nice. Which for a 500 seat theater is pretty darn impressive. Yeah. Well, Frankenstein is one that I've seen on the big screen. You guys saw it as well last year as part of the uh, Fathom Events thing that they did with TCM. But, right? that, you saw it. but that was digital. Yeah, this is film for you. Yes, so it was a it was a, di a little bit different experience. It wasn't as clear and crisp that you'll get with a digital. It had a lot more character to it, it that you'll get with a actual film film. Okay, but again, this is a film we had seen before, and we both uh, enjoyed this film. I, I think that um, you know we both like Colin Clive as uh, Henry Frankenstein, even though his name should be Victor. <laughs> 
And it was interesting to come back to this film after having seen Karloff in The Mummy and having seen Dwight Fry in Dracula and being able to do a little bit of compare and contrast of their roles and their acting styles in these two films. Are you sure there was Boris Karloff, though? Because in the opening credits, it was just question mark. (laughs) Well, you tell us. You saw it most recently. (laughs) He gets credit in the closing credits, though, I'm pretty sure. Yes. Yeah. No, this is one of the standards. I mean, it's one of the classics. It's probably the most popular of the original few universal classic monster movies. And I'm sure a big part of it has to do with Karloff and his charisma and his performance being able to act through that makeup. But there are so many other things happening in this film as well. I love the set design. Oh, gorgeous. Oh, wouldn't we just want to play around in there? Just go onto the set over a weekend when they're not shooting and just play? I'd be afraid of electrocuting myself. Well... Yeah, but it'd still be fun. <laughs> I'm I'm not sure which version of Frankenstein's lab I'd want to play in. I can think of three that I'd love to play in, and this is one of them. The other one is the Hammer version, and then the other one is Disney's Frankenweenie, where they basically replicated Frankenstein's lab, with, but if you'd used all kids' toys. And stuff you'd find in a typical attic. Yes. If I know correctly, you would know this more than I would. Weren't pieces of this set pulled out of storage and used some Young Frankenstein? Yes, it was. I mean, even Mel Brooks knows what's up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so again, our, our background in coming to this film, you just mentioned Young Frankenstein, which is a film very near and dear to my heart. I had seen Young Frankenstein before I saw Frankenstein. Yes, multiple times. And the more I think about it, I really don't think of Young Frankenstein as being just a parody of this in Bride of Frankenstein. It really is an homage as well. I mean, yeah, a lot of elements are played for laughs, but I think Mel Brooks and Gene Wilder really had a lot of respect for James Whale and the performances he was able to pull out of his actors and the whole atmosphere. I agree. I think Young Frankenstein stands on its own as a strong film, even without the comedic elements. I mean, there are still some very well put together scenes involving some frightening things. I mean, it's clearly a Mel Brooks movie, but it's also, you know, a Frankenstein film. And he doesn't mm-hmm. lose sight of that like he did when he did Dracula Dead and Loving It. But We will not, not speak a- of that film again. Oh, okay. We don't talk of that. But when I'm, okay. Got it. <laughs> now, one thing so, about this film and in, in comparing it with Dracula They both are remakes of stage versions of these two stories, but I think Frankenstein pulls it off better than Dracula does. And I don't know if it's the actors that are in the film don't feel as stagey to me. Well, having said that, there is the the Burgermeister and also Baron Frankenstein, which both are very stagey characters that were kind of grating. Yeah, Mm -hmm. melodramatic. There is some melodrama in it, but Whale doesn't seem to be afraid to move the camera around. Oh, yeah. When the father is walking the daughter into town after he finds her in the lake and, you know, brings her, you know, into town where everybody's partying and all that, and the camera moves with him. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some very interesting, for 1931, very interesting camera movements happening here. Browning either didn't know how to, didn't care to for whatever reason, didn't move his camera around very much. And this was kind of a holdover from a lot of the silent films, that sort of thing. And they all seem to have a better grasp on it. And I think we also see that in the lab sequences. There seems to be, again, he seems to appreciate the depth of field and, you know, found very interesting ways of framing some of the shots to just give you the feel for Henry Frankenstein's not quite descent into madness, but his obsessive focus on what he was doing. Well, you get yeah. the you get the impression, you know, you've got Henry, you've got Fritz kind of running around, turning on switches and everything at the beginning. And the camera is kind of doing a little bit of that too, almost to the point where you're a third character in there as the audience, getting that sense of um, anticipation. anticipation, bordering on chaos of what's going to happen. I thought that was really well done. And to see even more of that, I mean, I think Bride of Frankenstein has that in spades. I mean, you see oh, yeah. these crazy angles and shadows, and especially with Pretorius, it's just insane compared to what you see in this. And this one's got a lot of really good stuff in it, but I mean, you want to see James Whale 
unplug, check out Bride of Frankenstein. I mean, I would almost compare Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein to the Tim Burton Batman and then, was it Batman Returns? Was that the second one? I believe so. Mm -hmm. The first one feels very much like a studio picture. There are a lot of producers kind of sitting on him, telling him what he could and couldn't do. Whereas the second movie comes around, he's already kind of proven himself. He may have had some conditions that I get to do more if I'm going to come back and do a second film. And it's just kind of wonky all over the place. And that, you know, I get out of bride. This again, not to take anything away from Frankenstein. I think it's a, a great film as well. And I love that set, man. I would have loved, I, I would risk getting electrocuted. I think I'd flip a switch. I'd do it. <laughs> I'd do it. Yeah. Tying back to the hammer Frankenstein, which again, I had seen those previous to this Frankenstein. I almost think of Colin Clive's, Frankenstein being the young idealist fresh out of medical school, hey, let's see what we can do, whereas Cushing's Frankenstein is the more mature version. He already knows more what he's capable of, and he's the more detached scientific thinking, whereas Colin Clive still has a lot of the, the young enthusiasm about him. So I, I almost want to watch those two versions back to back to see that comp- see if that that comparison is really valid. That'd be a fun night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm watch thinking, darn, I get to watch him again. I know, right? <laughs> Man, it's tough being a monster kid, huh? <laughs> Edward Van Sloan in this film. What do you think of him? Again, he seems to be progressing in terms of his emotional involvement. I mean, he he seemed very invested in Henry Frankenstein's well-being. He wanted to make sure. I thought he kind of turned too quickly in this film because, yeah, at the beginning he was more worried about Henry the man. But then, boom, all of a sudden he's now basically Henry's assistant. Yeah, to a certain extent. But was he doing that because he still wanted to make sure Henry was going to be okay? Or was he more interested in... You know, the creature, and and did he get the romantic version of Henry's idea of creating another person? And he he just bought into that, and that's what he wanted to do. He didn't care about Henry anymore. Yeah, for me, it was a little bit, maybe he's going to be able to take some credit here because he was his teacher and that sort of thing. So I think he did get infected by Frankenstein's enthusiasm for the project and maybe forgot some of that. It, it seemed like he turned caution. too quickly for mm. me. Yeah. The version of the film that you saw, it was a film print. So I'm, real, I'm curious. There are two things that had been cut out of this film previously. The girl being thrown into the water. Did you see that in this version of the film? Yes, we did. Yes. Okay. And then after the, it's alive, it's alive, Clive also says, now I know what it's like to be God. Now, earlier cuts of this film had that line of dialogue kind of scrubbed out with a thunder sound effect instead, because I mean, it's a little, it's a little blasphemous, you know, and it's the thirties and censors and all that. Granted, when Bride of Frankenstein comes around, they have no problem with the story of two men trying to create life, but in Frankenstein, (laughs) they do have a problem with that. I honestly don't remember if that line remained. Yeah, I I can't remember hearing it either. Either way. I've heard it both ways. I don't mind the, I know what it's like to be God line in there. The problem that I have when I do hear it in the film is that it's not from a clean recording, unfortunately. Ah. So it's not, it kind of, it, you can tell it's been reinserted. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate having the complete version of the film and the completest in me wants to have that, but you know, it's clearly not something that was the same audio quality. It's like when you're watching a documentary and you can tell when somebody's doing a voiceover in a studio as opposed to doing something on screen. I, I don't know. My ear picks it up. Well, and before we go, we do have to mention that, of course, this film has the obligatory love triangle. <laughs> and That's interestingly right. enough, the, the other leg of the triangle is named Victor Moritz, whereas we have Henry <laughs> Frankenstein. But I, I thought John Bowles did an interesting job. He seemed a lot more lovelorn than some of the other third wheels in the relationships. Yeah, he kind of accepted the position that he was in. He just kind of loved uh, Elizabeth from afar, I think. Yeah. Well, I've been waiting for this moment for a while now. The final film, my favorite movie, starring my 50s girlfriend, that it doesn't sound like I have to share with Scott. (laughs) A movie that almost any time I have an opportunity to see it on the big screen, 
I will go see it. When it played here at the drive-in movie theater, I saw it two nights in a row. I've seen it in film. I've seen it digital. I own multiple copies of it here at the house. Creature from the Black Lagoon, 1954. My jam. <laughs> I love this movie. But have you seen it in 3D? Yes. When they showed it at the drive-in movie theater, it was in 3D. Uh, when I worked at a student-run movie theater many moons ago when I was going to film school and thought I'd be a filmmaker when I grew up, we had it come in in 3D as well as its sequel, Revenge of the Creature, in 3D film. Now, I have not seen the 3D version of it on Blu-ray in the set that just came out. I am trying to find the time to make that happen. I've got a friend who's got the setup. It's just a matter of schedule. <laughs> but I will make that happen. I love this movie, man. It's uh, I don't know what it is about this movie, but it, it is the one that I go back to. I'm gushing. You guys, take over. <laughs> well, we, Cut we, me off. Cut my mic. <laughs> <laughs> we did have the opportunity to see it in 3D, but the old school red and blue glasses. And this was the first time I had seen the film. And this was the first time that I had seen it all the way through. I had seen parts of it at different times, but I had never sat down to watch the whole thing. Can we still be friends? Of course we can. <laughs> like I said, it doesn't sound like I have to share Julie Adams with anybody, so we're good. I'm keeping track. <laughs> <laughs> I love Creatures from the Black Lagoon for more than just Julie Adams, okay, who I think outside of obviously, yes, I have a crush on her, but I also like her performance in the movie. There's more about the movie that I like than just her. I love the creature design. I love the music. I love the cinematography. I love that this movie bridges the gap between the old style 40s, 30s, monster movie for Universal, and the science fiction horror movies that Universal would be getting into in the fit later in the 50s. It's got both elements. It's got a Beauty and the Beast story. It's got science gone wrong, sort of, you know, different evolution things happening. It just has everything going for it as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it was interesting to see this film as the finale. Again, as we mentioned, we went from 1931, Dracula and Frankenstein, all the way up to 1954. It was interesting to see the advancement of acting, and this one especially filmmaking. The underwater scenes in this film blew my mind. They're stunning. It's, it's just gorgeous. I don't know if part of it was seeing it in 3D or what, but in terms of just the filmmaking, this is definitely my favorite of the six films. Well, and keep in mind, they had to take those big 3D cameras and put those underwater. And this mm -hmm. isn't just a film camera. This is high-end technology for the time. They're submerging. I mean, this... Right. And the, you know, water, during, the underwater stuff, man, is gorgeous. Yeah, during the whole film, you know, I'm thinking mostly of, you know, Riku Browning and all the work he was doing as Gill Man. But then I started thinking, well, what about all the camera people? They had to stay underwater just as long as he did. Focus on keeping him in focus. True, they were probably actually had the aqua lungs and the scuba <laughs> tanks on him, but True. still, everywhere he went, they went too. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think he's the true star of this film, even though he's not credited in the credits. I, I loved Rico Browning oh, in, in the work that he did. I would love to meet him just to thank him. I've met him. Uh, he came to a Crypticon Seattle a couple years ago, and I had a chance to meet him and chat with him. And you know, he tells the story. He was not somebody who was a movie guy or anything like that. He was a diver. He was a swimmer. And he was hired to get in the suit. Now, he kind of turned that into various, I guess, a movie career after that. He did some other films. He would come back to do The Gill Man in the following two films, you know, mm -hmm. two sequels, as well as do some other things. He also is credited as creating the uh, TV show Flipper. <laughs> <laughs> So he never really got too far away from the water. Mm -hmm. But I can't imagine swimming upside down, submerged completely in just my swimsuit. Much less in a suit that must have weighed probably all of 30, 40 pounds, you think? Oh, easily. I know. Probably even With more a, so when it, once it got wet. You know, and there's a mini tank in there and everything. And it's just, man, the sequences underwater are amazing. Now, that's not to take anything away from Ben Chapman, who played the creature on land. You know, Chapman is no longer with us, but he also, from what I understand, was an incredibly sweet man, incredibly humble, loved to meet his fans. And he's a big guy. Now, compared to Rico Browning, he's a much bigger presence, well, which kind of works when you see the gill man up on top. It's okay yeah. to see him big. Well, I just figured it was, you know, how light travels through water. You got the little bit of change in the size. Okay, Mr. Science. Yeah. <laughs> well, you never really see 
the underwater gill man. There's in, no, no really sp- uh, perspective that you can right, tell exactly, how tall right. he is. I mean, is. yeah, you do see a little bit at the very end of the film of him fighting Mark Williams. But again, there, you don't see scenes back to back with Chapman and Browning, respectively, portraying Gill Man. When it comes to anything that happens underwater, the only time you see the Gill Man kind of sort of interacting with one of our main characters, it's Kay. But it's not played by Julie Adams. It's her double. So <laughs> you, you don't even have that relation to kind mm-hmm. of look at. You mentioned Mark Williams. He's played by Richard Denning, who is my connection to the Wolfman because Richard Denning and Evelyn Anchors were married. Ah. And they ended up living in Hawaii toward the end of their life. Uh, Richard Denning actually appeared in the original Hawaii Five-0 as the governor of Hawaii hmm. in several episodes, So, which I've never seen. I need to go back and check it out now. But uh, I, I love Richard Denning in this. Uh, I'm a big fan of his work. I'm a big fan of Richard Carlson, the other male part of the love triangle here, and, of course, Julie Adams. I didn't like Mark Williams, but again, I enjoyed Richard Denning's performance. I thought he right. was very effective. I enjoyed <laughs> Richard Carlin as as Dr. Reed. Oh, Richard and, Carlson's amazing. He's so good. And he's not the traditional romantic lead because he's got that face. He's not Yeah. You he's know? not classic. He looks handsome. more like every man than a mm-hmm. which means I've got a shot. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I liked Julie Adams all the way through, and I really liked Kay Lawrence at the beginning of the film. You know, she's got her own career. She has the scientific chops to support her participation in the expedition, and then apparently leaves her brains in California. Yeah, her well, character changes a lot when she jumps off the boat by herself. In unknown <laughs> waters, well, no one else on deck. It was a tight swimming suit. You had to take something out to fit into it. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, I just, <laughs> you know, I, I, again, I, I was really looking forward to her involvement in the investigation of what the creature was. Not really. Yeah. You know, she becomes the damsel in distress. I think she, she barely defends herself against the creature any of the times that the two of them interact. I think what she throws a, a lantern at him once. That's about it. So, Again, coming from the perspective of 2013. I, and I'll agree with you. I'm going to give you that, and I agree 100%. Yep. I Again, think, nothing, nothing against Julie Adams. No, that, not at That's all. the way the character was written. She portrayed the character beautifully in yeah. more ways than one. <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah, no, I hear exactly what you're saying. And, and full disclosure here, I agree 100%. I think... Kay is great at the beginning, especially when Dr. Maia is, you know, talking to David, you know, why aren't you two married? Well, he can't afford me yet. You know, they're really kind of playing off this, they're equals, or mm-hmm. she maybe even be higher in the pecking order than he is in terms of what they do there at the, at the Institute. It's a very interesting relationship that we're starting to get to see a little bit of. Right. But you're right, you get later into the movie and it does become she's bait. <laughs> you know, now, she's really just the woman. Now, have they remade creature no <laughs> if, yes. if okay, they ever of, do or if they do a good job of it i would love to see a more modern take on k lawrence so they, they did kind of sort of remake it universal studios for a very short time had a rock and roll musical production of creature from the black lagoon that they yep. showed at their california theme park i never got a chance to see it i've seen some youtube clips and i've got the music it's not that good, and there's no wonder that it has not remained an attraction at Universal. And I think it only lasted like nine months. I mean, it, it wasn't even a year. didn't last very long at all. Yeah, it didn't last very long at all. It wasn't a rousing success. Now, Julie Adams was there opening night, you know, and they tried real hard to make it a thing. And it, she's singing a lot. You know, Kay is singing a lot and seems to be a more assertive type character in that particular production. Mm-hmm. And there have been talks about remaking this movie for years. There was talk of it in the 80s, and there was somebody attached to it whose name I'm kind of blanking on. I know at one point uh, a creature design was redone for the Gill Man. That creature design ended up being used in the Monster Squad as that monster's uh-huh. that movie's a creature from the Black Lagoon stand-in. Breck Eisner at one point was attached to the remake, Breck being the son of Michael Eisner. Uh-huh. So there's our Disney connection for this episode. <laughs> sort of. And uh, 
which I've seen some Breck Eisner horror projects. He did some television, that sort of thing. Wasn't a huge fan. I'm glad he's no longer attached to the project. At one point, Del Toro had talked about it. Ooh, that could be interesting. But as far as I know, there really hasn't been much more said about it lately. Okay. Because again, I, I would like to see a more, like I said, I'd like to see a more modern take on But well, well, even she could still be the quote unquote damsel in distress at the end of the film if she was still just involved with the investigation. Right. It's like all the guys on the ship forgot that she even knew anything because they don't ask her opinion on anything. She's not involved in any of the scientific part of the look. She's just there as eye candy and maybe to go get coffee or something. So if I were to try to justify this, and I know it's hard and maybe I shouldn't even bother, I think it becomes pretty clear to the entire crew, you know, the professor, Lucas, Whit Bissell, who's one of my favorite character actors from these movies, that Mark really had something going on for Kay. He really wanted to be with Kay. Mm-hmm. And isn't happy that David kind of won that triangle. He treats her the worst out of all of them. Oh, yeah. I think he is pretty disrespectful. He tries. You know, he puts a move on, but she stops him cold. He shuts her down. Now, being the money man on the exhibition, are you going to fight that? I don't, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe she, she does have to play a very fine line there. I'll, I'll give you that and that. But it is still tough. Yeah. Getting back to Whit Bissell. Yeah. Why was Dr. Thompson on the exposition? <laughs> Because he it can just smoke me- a mean pipe. <laughs> uh, is it just me or was he the token red shirt? <laughs> I don't really know. Yeah, because honest to goodness, there's one scene with, I think it was after, I'm, I'm forgetting now, but I think it was after they captured the Gill Man, and it's a scene with him and Kay, and she's talking, and there's like two or three different spots where it would have made perfect sense for him to actually say something. But instead, you just get a nod or a, a noncommittal grunt. And I'm, I'm going, did they not pay him to say any lines in this <laughs> scene? <laughs> yeah, he talks very little. I mean, it's a shame. I love, like I said, I love Whit Bizzle. He's one of my favorite character actors in these movies. I love him in the Teenage Frankenstein and Teenage Werewolf films. He doesn't get to do much in this. No. And before everybody out there thinks that Tracy and I didn't like this film... We enjoyed this film quite a bit, and I want to get back to the underwater filming. Sure. It was just amazing. I mean, even to the point where, you know, watching the Gill Man, the way that they could portray that he had that intelligence, I mean, blocking the ship in that little cove, you knew that the Gill Man was smarter than just a fish in there that just wanted to attack people. They, they, they portrayed that really well. Yes. There's a real sense of intelligence behind mm-hmm. what they're doing. And the design of the Gill Man, okay. I mean, hands down, iconic, looks amazing. The only flaw, the only flaw that I see in this thing is that the first time you see the Gill Man's hand come up and he drags his claws in the dirt and it goes back underwater, one of the nails bends a little bit like you can tell it's rubber. But that's only because I've seen the movie a thousand times. Other than that, I think this is a perfect monster design. In future films, they kind of t- change it a little bit. They change his eyes out. And Rico Browning was not cast originally as the underwater creature, so it doesn't fit on him quite the same way as it did in the first time around because they did a different suit. I love the design of this thing. Now, there's been some controversy over the years about who designed this creature. One of the Westmores was taking credit for it or was given credit for it for a long time, but Millicent Patrick actually was also very involved. And she's got some very tangential Disney connections that Scott and I have talked about trying to uncover down the line at some point. Yeah, I've seen where she's been uh, credited as being a Disney animator But unfortunately, I've not been able to find anything that she's done for Disney. In fact, you go to her IMDb page, it doesn't doesn't list anything Disney related. Not at all. I mean, she's a very private person, so that might have been why. But I'd love to learn more and just kind of respect her contribution to film. Yeah. And so maybe at some point, if Scott and I stumble across something, we'll talk about that in a future episode. But yeah, the the creature design was great. And I, I love the way that they slowly show him. In the in the like you were talking about the hand coming up, they do that a couple times. You get these little quick glimpses of him before you you full on see the the creature, and I 
thought that was a, a great way to introduce him to the audience. You weren't in the first scene seeing the whole thing. They, they, they saved the money shot to later. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, oh, and yeah. even though I'm griping a lot about Kay Lawrence, I also really enjoyed this film. I enjoyed the whole message behind it. The don't mess with Mother Nature kind of aspects. And I, I thought that was kind of forward thinking for the 50s. From that aspect, I could see this film as being, you know, coming from the mid or late 60s in terms of that theme. So to respond to that, I kind of just kind of glossed over when Scott said that earlier. And I'm going to gloss it over this time, too, because I don't think you guys are saying you don't like the movie. I actually enjoy being able to talk about these things with people, you know, have different points of views and perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. I still love the film despite it or in spite of it. And I don't want anybody to walk away from this episode of Monster Kid Radio thinking that you guys just trashed my favorite movie because that's not what happened here. So for the record, I don't think you guys are saying anything bad here at all. That's right. We but, weren't talking about the return of she. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> – but then also you said don't mess with Mother Nature and that is something that the director, Jack Arnold – really seemed to explore with a lot, at least the movies that he did for Universal. Tarantula, The Incredible Shrinking Man. There are wow. things out there, science, Mother mm -hmm. Nature-wise, you should not mess with, you should not explore. And I think, I mean, it's telling that the guy who gets killed in The Creature from the Black Lagoon by the creature directly is the guy who wants to exploit him. Yep. Yeah, I, I really in enjoyed that. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't like I didn't like Mark to start with. So seeing yeah, seeing him get it, just but the, yeah, like you said, the fact that he he was the exploiter, he was in on this project to see what he as the businessman could get out of it. Whereas Doctor Reed and Kay and apparently Doctor Thompson were there <laughs> for the exploration. They were there to increase human knowledge. Yeah. You know, they were there to see a creature that they thought may have been extinct millions of years ago. Mm -hmm. And so they get an opportunity to study something from that time frame. They're all over that. And really, Mark just wants to basically cage him up and put him on display and charge five bucks a head to, for people to see him. Man, a we living know from King Kong, it doesn't matter how well that goes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> stuff him if we got to. We're going to bring him back. You know, I also like the we might be able to learn something from this thing to help us maybe live in other environments because it's obviously adapted. And, you know, it's it's all very altruistic. Mm -hmm. There's nothing really like we're going to dissect it and see how it works. It's, you know, we're going to study it. And I appreciate that. The music in the film. I love the music in this thing. And apparently so did Universal because they used it in so many other <laughs> movies afterwards. Including one that you and I've seen together on the big screen. <laughs> Man, when we saw King Kong versus Godzilla, the U.S. cut, and the Creature from the Black Lagoon music kicks in when the giant octopus attacks the village. Man! <laughs> I, I don't know if anybody knows this, but I would love to know how many films at least that stinger has been used in. Well, they used it to open Tarantula as well, which is another Jack Arnold film. In fact, I think they used it to open a handful of their science fiction monster movies. That opening, dun, 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 you know, that opening bit. What's interesting, though, you know, a lot of this music got reused in other movies. Some of the music from Creature and Revenge of the Creature actually came from other sources. So... It's, it's recycling. Life. Yeah, it is recycling. A lot of it's all kind of stock music. I mean, uh, I believe music, if I read this, I don't remember which cue it is, but there's music from a Western in which you see a horse being born, like the scene in which the ho a new horse is being born and brought into the world. The music from that scene ended up in one of the creature films. Hmm. Go figure. I don't know how it was used, but <laughs> I it's just iconic music. I can't hear the music without mm -hmm. thinking of the Gill Man. I just can't. Even for me, as someone who hasn't seen this film near as many times as you have, I instantly recognize it from this film, no matter where it shows up. Yeah. Well, you both have seen Revenge of the Creature, though. I mean, it's in that as well. Yes. We have seen that because it was uh, featured in uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000. And it also has a um, one of the first screenshots of uh, Clint Eastwood. Very first film. That's yep. his first appearance. He's also uncredited in, in Tarantula, if we're going to mention that film as well. Yeah, he turns up at the very end of Tarantula in a, in a jet. <laughs> yeah, he's a jet pilot. Yeah, he, he drops an napalm on the, on the spider. But, yeah, I mean, so you guys have had some experience with the Gill Man. Now, going into Creature after already having seen Revenge, Mistied, do you think it hampered 
enhance the experience. I don't think it had any effect on it yeah, either way. To, to be honest, I didn't remember enough from seeing that misted, seeing Revenge misted to, for it to impact either way. What probably impacted Creature more is it being the last of the six films, and I definitely want to see it again. Yeah, we in, had theater butt by that point. Yeah, <laughs> we really <laughs> did. So I, w- I want to see Creature again with, with fresh eyes in terms of being a little more rested. And maybe I won't be quite so critical of Kay this time around. <laughs> well, Scott told us what his favorite of the six films was. What is your favorite of the six that you saw this weekend, Tracy? I had a really hard time deciding. For me, it's a tie between Wolfman and Invisible Man in terms of the lead actors and their, their powerful performances. Uh, Creature would be an honorable mention because of the cinematography. So that, I guess that means the two best known Universal Monster films were my least favorite. Nothing wrong Mummy, with that. Yeah, because Mummy was also very high up there. Karloff, Reigns, and Cheney were just magnificent in their lead roles. Very powerful performances. I want to see more films from all three of them. In comparison, you know, Lugosi, again, is a very powerful actor, but in a, it seems like in a very narrow range. I enjoyed his performance, but I have a hard time imagining him. Careful. In, <laughs> I, and again, I haven't seen him in a whole lot of no, other roles. You're right. You other are than, absolutely right. Other than Plan 9, which oh, is yeah. not at all a fair comparison, because I think he's only in, what, three scenes total? He has yeah, no uh, lines, yeah. yeah, and most of his role was played by the chiropractor. So what I would recommend, and I've been kind of thinking about this ever since we talked about maybe doing this as a, an episode or two on Monster Kid Radio. You want to see more movies by these performers that you really enjoyed. For Karloff and Lugosi stuff, I know they weren't really at the top of your list compared to the movies that you were just talking about. I would highly recommend that you both track down a movie called The Black Cat starring these two. I borrowed the... Uh, Bella Lugosi collection from the library yes. this week. So we're we're going to try that yeah, one out. Because there's another film that we saw when we went to the 8mm film festival that we talked about on a previous episode of Monster Kid Radio that we want to see that has the two of them in it, and that's The Raven. That one's also really good. The reason I go with The Black Cat is because there's some world reversal happening here. Now, while Karloff started his career as, well, came into his career because of Frankenstein's monster. A lot of times he's associated with being the good guy. You know, he's this childlike kind of monster. He can't help it, whatever. You know, he did the Grinch for crying out loud. He's a good guy. In the Black Cat, he is not the good guy at all. And Lugosi, who is a Dracula, he's the good guy in the Hmm. Black Cat. Interesting. it's really interesting to watch them play against their stereotypes in the Black Cat. So I'd recommend you check that one out. All right. As far as... Cheney, Inner Sanctum, I think. If you're not going to watch more Wolfman movies, which you should, <laughs> Inner Sanctum was a radio show. It was a kind of a suspense radio show that right. got adapted as some films. There were six films, and Lon Chaney is the lead in all six of them. He oh. has his chance to play the romantic lead. Now, he's a little heavy. He's a little big. But he has his chance to play the romantic lead in these movies. Sometimes they're a little hammy. And I think in every single one of them, he's got some voiceover stuff where, you know, he's acting on screen like he's thinking real hard and you get to hear what he's thinking. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's Lon Chaney Jr. It doesn't matter. It's cool. And like I said, Weird Woman is fantastic. Okay. So if I were to recommend any future films by these, the the big three, you know, Lugosi, Karloff, or Lon Chaney Jr., I'd go that route. As far as Claude Rains goes, I don't have a lot of experience with him outside of what I've seen in the Universals. And so if you come other, across anything, I'm curious to hear what you got. <laughs> what other Universal films? Well, you know, you liked Invisible Man. I'd probably go with the follow-up because you get to get Vincent Price in on the mix. Fair enough. You, know, you get to hear Vincent Price as the Invisible Man, who is also really good. Yeah, I, I like Price. And then, you know, I can't get enough Creature. You know, when I look at these movies now, because I've seen so many of them, so many of these 
classic movies in the pantheon of universal classics. What I'm doing now, at least with Creature, is I'm going through and I'm looking at the lead actors and I'm trying to find other movies that they were in that may not have been universal pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Richard Carlson was in The Magnetic Monster, which I really liked. Richard Denning was in The Black Scorpion, which is fantastic. Julie Adams was in Underwater City in 1960, which is a great film that I wish had an a really good DVD release because I'd buy it in a minute. So, I mean, it's fun for me to go back and look at those connections and try to branch out from there. If you come across any awesome Claude Rains movies you think I need to see, I'm, you know, like I said, keep me posted. Or we can throw that out to the listeners. What, yes. uh, what are their recommendations for more works by these actors? And again, doesn't have to be monster related, though that never hurts. <laughs> That's true. We're taking a look at Claude Rains's yes. page and I, I, have seen him in another movie that would be Casablanca where he played oh, yeah, the, uh, the French lieutenant who was shocked shocked to learn there was gambling <laughs> yep. here and yes. and I I've, I've seen him in uh, Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know Colin Clive was in Mad Love with Peter Lorre which is also a great film also directed by Carl Freund oh. so I'd recommend you know you guys check that out if you haven't seen it so Very you good. get some Peter Lorre in the mix which you know is always a good thing oh yes or should I say Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and quite possibly he may show up in the the next film that Derek and I talk about on Monster Kid Radio. Really? The uh, Disney Indiana crossover. Is he in that? Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. What the hell is wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, well, overall, uh, this was an amazing experience. I came in having seen only one of these films previously, and that only once before the previous year. So these were all, while I was aware of all of them through pop culture, what have you, it was such a treat to be able to see them all on the big screen for the first time. And in a place such as the Artcraft Theater was just the perfect setting for this. We also, like I said earlier, went to the Hitchcock Film Festival a year ago, uh, the art craft is already trying to come up with uh, future film festivals. In fact, they were taking um, recommendations. recommendations all weekend. They had a, a sign-up sheet where you could go and uh, say what kind of film festival you'd like to do next. They're looking at actually possibly doing two next year, maybe one in the spring and one in the fall. Yeah, we wrote in a Ray Harryhausen Film Festival and Vincent Price Film Festival. And I wrote in a James Bond Film Festival and a Hammer Film Festival. Nice. Well, I would go to all of those. So would we. If the movie theater was closer to me. <laughs> but if you if they do another festival that's relevant to Monster Kid Radio and you two are going to go, let's put together a Monster Kid Radio crash for anybody who might be in the area. And then you can all go see the movie together because it's always more fun to watch these movies with fellow Monster Kids, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. We did actually strike up a conversation with a couple of people throughout the weekend and discovered another fellow Hammer fan that we passed along the uh, podcast information about, as well as Monster Kid Radio, of course. Very cool. Well, again, go to Historic Art Craft Theater, and that's R-E, not E-R at the end, dot org, or follow the link in the show notes at monsterkidradio.net to keep up with what the Historic Art Craft Theater is doing. You can find Scott and Tracy at DisneyIndiana.com every other week, talking about their life as Disney fans. Thousands of miles away from the nearest theme park, is that how the slogan goes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hundreds of miles, but... Hundreds of miles, okay. Actually, I think but it's just too far away. We don't, <laughs> we don't specify how many miles. Just it's got to feel like away. thousands, right? Yeah. At least 20,000 leagues. <laughs> you can find Scott and Tracy every other week at Disney Indiana at DisneyIndiana.com. You can find Scott joining me and Casey Criswell over at 1951 Down Place every month to talk about Hammer Films. And I'm sure you're going to hear Scott and Tracy on future episodes of Monster Kid Radio. Big thanks to them for appearing on this week's show. Next week, I got some things cooking. So you're just going to have to keep your iPod, your smartphone, or your computer locked in at monsterkidradio.net. Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio, LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio, LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivations, 3.0, unported license. Of course, that does not apply to the song Welcome to Nuclear City. That belongs to the Radioactive Kids, and it appears on this episode of Monster Kid Radio with their permission. It can also be found on their self-titled album over at radioactivekids.bandcamp.com. Talk to everybody next week.
Bruno Clark. 